to understand. But it was all a part of the master's plan. But although it happened unexpectedly, we still don't cry for me because I'll see you Nineteen doves to the heavens. I welcome you here to Petco Park and thank you so much for being here. I'm Ted Leitner. It has been my privilege of 20 years to broadcast Padre baseball during the time that Tony played. So I had the game and I had a game within the game of watching T-Bat four times a game. Incredibly privileged. And so many times at this microphone and at this podium with events with Tony and for Tony honoring him. And I say to you from the bottom of my heart, and I know you share this, there was never a time that I thought that we would have 
this particular ceremony here today. Not in my lifetime, but it is what it is. So we will cry together, we will laugh together, we will have joy together today, but one thing we will never, never do is to forget the greatest hitter of his generation and one of the greatest people in the history of Major League Sport. And, and, and let me ask one favor of you. Let me impose on you. I hope I've been here long enough to impose on you. I know I've aggravated you at times, so certainly I can impose on you. Because in all of those events that we had after 3,000 hits and after his induction in Cooperstown and after his induction into the Padre Hall of Fame and all the others that I was privileged to have this microphone and I'm honored that the Padres would ask me again to do this here today. I would like one more time, one final standing ovation before the anthem for that magnificent Padre, number 19, Tony Gwynn. I hear you. I hear you, Tony, Tony. That's all right. That's all right. Let him hear it. Let him hear it. If you will remain standing, we will honor our beloved country with the playing of the national anthem and so fittingly being played and another welcome to those from the Aztec nation as well as this program put on by my San Diego Padres. Mr. Ransom conducting the San Diego State Aztec Pep Band. Thank you so much. I would like to introduce members of Tony's family, and I will say to her now what I said to her Saturday at the service, that it was a privilege to know both you and Tony, Alicia. Thank you so much for sharing him with us, your unselfishness to allow him to have that unselfishness to be with us. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you.
to his beloved daughter, how many times he would say things to me about her and glow and glow, his daughter, Anisha Gwynn Jones. Welcome. His sister, Char Smith, and his brothers, his oldest brother, Charles, who we learned so much about life and baseball from, and from our former Padre, Chris Quinn, who is with us here today. And he always told me, he always told me, his most joyous moment with a base hit was his home run in game one of the World Series in Yankee Stadium in 1998 against David Wells. But his second most favorite hit that brought him the second most joy in his life was the double by Chris that beat the Dodgers to clinch the division in 1996. Yeah. They lied to us, you know. They lied to us in the movie A League of Their Own when the manager and the Tom Hanks character said, there's no crying in baseball. Wrong, huh? Since June 16, there's been almost nothing but crying in baseball. But Tuesday night, in that tough city of Philadelphia, tough, tough fans, when Tony Jr. pinch hit to a standing ovation for almost 60 seconds with tears in those eyes of those Philadelphians, that's the love for Tony Jr. and that's the love for Tony Sr. in Major League Baseball. Our first speaker knows Tony, for so long, way before he was a Padre owner, he was a Padre fan and a businessman here. He won't need a script tonight. He'd speak from the heart any time about Tony because he knew him for over 30 years. Would you welcome, please, the executive chairman of our Padre ownership, Mr. Ron Fowler. Thanks, Ted. I'm up here tonight on behalf of Padres ownership and the entire Padres organization to thank Alicia and the other members of the Gwynn family for both being here and for allowing us as a community to pay tribute to our Mr. Padre. I'd also like to thank all of Tony's fans, the thousands of you who are here tonight for joining us. Tony was important to all of us, and the number of wonderful stories since his passing from around the country reinforces the many reasons why he was loved by so many. I first met Tony at SDSU in 1980, when he was playing baseball for Jim Dietz. Even then, more than 34 years ago, you could tell he was something special. And Coach Dietz, for those of you who knew him, has never been big on compliments. But he indicated that this kid, as he called him, had a great future. Two years later, on July 19, 1982, yes, 7-19-82, Tony became a Padre. We all know of Tony's iconic status as one of the greatest baseball players ever. But even more importantly, many of us experience his special qualities as a warm, giving, and compassionate member of our community. What stood out most for me was Tony's ability to relate to people from all demos and economic strata, and his special ability to relate to children even those adults who think we're children of all ages. 
Tony considered himself an everyman, and he remained an everyman throughout his entire life. So approachable and so easy for San Diego's to embrace him as our city's favorite son. Tony will be truly missed by everyone in the Padres organization and by the entire San Diego community. But his memory will live on in our hearts forever as our Mr. Padre. Tony, may you rest in peace. Thank you, Ron. All I want him to say about me is that I played the game the way it was supposed to be played, period. Period. You know, they're going to say he was a pretty good hitter. You know, they're, they're probably going to mention he won a couple of gold gloves and stole some bases one year, you know. Um, but for me, I played the game the way it was supposed to be played. I worked hard at it. I prepared for it. I tried to execute. You know, I tried to keep the fans involved. You know, I tried to keep my community involved. I tried to keep my teammates involved. See, Ron hit it on the head. People identified with him more than big, muscled, sculptured athletes because they thought he was the guy next door. Tony was chunky. He knew that. He was sensitive about it, too. He was sensitive. He told me this. People who wrote about it and broadcast that he needed to lose weight, yada, yada. He was four for five today. He doesn't need to lose weight, okay? And he would say... <laughs> And he would say, hey, sports writer, if you're four for five, then you can shut up. You know, same thing. He said, I knew his dad, Charles, so well. He'd sit with Jerry and I in the broadcast booth in Dodger Stadium and watch his boy and just beam. And Charles was chunky. The family's chunky, whatever. It didn't matter. It had nothing to do. But he was to all of us and all of you, part of the Padre family. He was the guy next door. And there was even more identification because of that and his amazing, amazing personality. Many of you were there in 2007 when he was inducted with the Immortals, literally, in the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. It was the biggest crowd in Cooperstown history beyond Ruth, beyond Mantle, beyond Aaron, beyond anybody when he and Cal Ripken were inducted that hot summer day in 07. 30,000 more than any other induction weekend in Hall of Fame history. And now, to speak on behalf of his friend, another Hall of Famer, a fellow Hall of Famer, who was, just like Tony, one of the dominant ones of his era, without any question. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. October, Mr. Reggie Jackson right here. Thank you. More, more than, more than anybody that was ever inducted. <laughs> we all know Tony was a great player, great Hall of Famer. That is known when you recognize it. He got 97% of the vote, which puts him in the top four or five, I think. I'd like to give a Yankee salute to the Gwynn family, Alicia and Mrs. Gwynn, all the brothers and sisters and children, I will tell you that I'm honored to speak tonight because I have a great amount of respect for the dash that Tony Gwynn represented. His 54 years, it's really all about the dash. He was a genuine man, he was a quality man, 100% family man, he was a great son, 
a great husband, a great father, and a great brother, a great friend, and a great teammate. He was the example of what we all want to live and emulate as a person. He cared about his fellow man, and we understand and know that he cared about his community. He's a great Christian. I saw him at San Diego State University, and all he could talk about was his, was his kids, some kid named Strasburg. He loved being around him. During the dash of his 54 years, he showed us a template of how to live with dignity. The only thing he ever did that I didn't like is every time he saw me, he always called me Mr. Jackson. I'll leave you with something to think about as I refer about baseball. I saw some great hitters. I saw Mike Schmidt and Jim Rice, Kaline Dick Allen and Molitor Yount and Brett, Cooper and Bench. I saw Mays Aaron, Clemente, Billy Williams, Stargell and Stretch McCovey. I saw Banks at the end. Number 19, Tony Gwynn, belongs on that page. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. I appreciate it. And we all do that you're here today. See, nobody's talking about at bats and number of hits. We know those numbers, 3,141 hits and 15 all-star games and eight batting titles and five gold gloves and all that stuff. But it's, and that is greatness unto itself, but it's so beyond that. It's so beyond that about the man and the compassion. Although there was a stat that I saw from Jason Stark, a broadcaster and writer that said, if you take Tony's 338 lifetime average and you add 1,180, at bats, as in he might have an 0 for 1100, and he'd still have a 300 lifetime average. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about. When pitchers would be asked, how do you pitch to Tony Gwynn? And they'd use the old line by the Boston Red Sox, Frank Sullivan, and pitching to Mickey Mantle, when they would ask him, how do you pitch to Tony Gwynn? With tears in my eyes. That's how. But he stayed here. It was never about the money. It was about you folks. It was about you folks. Yeah, it was about this Padres organization that he loved. And you and I both know he could have made about five times more money as a free agent. He was never about the money. And the next speaker, by the way, knows this because he negotiated for him, but he was more than an agent to him. He was a best friend to him. Here is John Boggs, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ted, and good evening. I had the distinct privilege of representing a great man, Tony Gwynn, for close to 30 years. It has been incredibly difficult, first of all, speaking tonight, but since Tony passed away, it's been a fine balance between mourning the loss of Tony, celebrating his life. Alicia, Anthony, Mrs. Gwynn, Charles, and Chris, our hearts and prayers go out to you. Tony loved you so much, the entire Gwynn family. I can't imagine the loss you feel at this time, but I do know your family and friends and this entire community are here for you. Tony was a very humble man, and he wasn't big on ceremonies especially ceremonies that were about him. But I know he's looking down this evening on all of us here at Petco, and I'm sure he's very grateful for this outpouring of love. I can also imagine Tony seeing 
and, and, and saying to himself, looking at me at this microphone, Boggsy, keep it short. So with that, I'd like to attempt the impossible to talk about Tony in a brief period of time. He was an incredible friend. He was a definition of friend. In life, there are a lot of acquaintances, but very few true friends. I was blessed to experience that friendship with Tony. He touched so many people, and I was just lucky to be one of them. I met him in the early 80s working for Garvey Marketing Group, and that turned into a day that changed my life when Tony and Alicia came to my office and asked if I would be Tony's agent. It was the fastest yes that ever crossed my lips. A dream come true and incredible. And that privilege created so many memories, and I'm not just talking about the eight batting titles, the Hall of Fame, the All-Star Game. No, I'm talking about being around Tony Gwynn, the man, the person. We had so, he was so much better than the statistics he accumulated. I smile from remembering how he loved to set me up. We'd do an appearance and uh, the fans would line up to get his autograph. He'd turn to me and say, all right, Bogsy, uh, one autograph per person, right? I said, absolutely. And sure enough, the line would start and there'd be a little boy that came up and put three balls down and I had to tell him only one autograph per person. And Tony would look at the little boy and then he'd look at me and he'd say, don't listen to him, he's not in charge. I'll sign whatever you got. <laughs> then he'd smile and he'd give me that great laugh. Gosh, did he have a great laugh. Then there was his work ethic. He'd go four for four and yet not be really happy with his performance because his swing didn't feel right. Then he'd go 0 for 4 and I'd say, tough game, T. And he'd go, no, I hit the ball every time on the screws. I'm locked in. There was also the memory of Tony and Ted Williams together in the first interview they did together. And I've never seen Tony so energized and excited as two of the greatest hitters exchange baseball knowledge. Ted peppered Tony with every question and Tony answered every one of them absolutely to the T. And Ted would say, correct on every one. It was truly a memorable baseball moment that I know Tony cherished and I was just lucky to be a fly on the wall. And obviously, Tony's humility waiting for that Hall of Fame call, I could not believe how nervous he was. With all his accomplishments, I said, Tony, this is a slam dunk. And he just smiled and looked at me and said, hey, you never know. That was Tony. He never took anything for granted. Tony, thank you for your incredible loyalty, for all the memories, and one of the truest friendships anyone could wish for. I can tell you during Tony's career, there were many teams that would have loved to have him in their lineup. But he would say, I'm not going anywhere. This is where I belong, and San Diego is home. To the fans, he loved you and appreciated you more than I convey into words. He loved the city of San Diego. He loved being an Aztec. And he most definitely loved being a Padre. He was and always will be Mr. Padre. <laughs> we will always remember you, T. God bless you, buddy. Thank you.
Thank you, Bugsy. John told me, make sure you tell him about the first gold glove. Because <laughs> Tony was not a good outfielder at San Diego State. He was not. He turned himself into a great outfielder. The Gwyn way. Work, work, long toss, 200 feet, 300 feet, on and on and on, till he became a guy with a big arm that you would not run on, remember? And a great right fielder. And he was on a speaking engagement in the South. Told me had the flu, sick as can be. And Bogsy called him and said, Tony, you won your first gold glove. And he, Tony told me, as sick as he was, he, by himself, in the hotel room, jumped up and down on the bed. No, no, not just up and down, but the bicycle thing. You know, the legs pumping, legs pumping like pistons. I won my first gold glove. Yeah, with his hard work, like he always did. There has been an outpouring of love, not just here, but throughout the nation. On the 16th, Jimmy Kimmel of ABC from his talk show tweeted, this country has lost my favorite athlete of all time. And those tributes have come from all across the country, and they're coming now, if you will join us on the video boards here at Petco Park. I'm a Padre, I'm a San Diego Padre, and, I, and I've been a Padre my whole career, and I'm proud of that. And uh, everything I've done, I've done in a Padre uniform. So when my career is over and people look back and they see San Diego all the way down the line, man, that, that means a lot to me. Please tell me he's with Cammy, Ken Caminetti, Colonel Coleman, somewhere tonight. Would you welcome, please, the mayor of the city of San Diego, California, the Honorable Kevin Faulkner. Good evening. Tony Gwynn represented the best of San Diego. His infectious personality did more than spark the Padres the two World Series appearances. He lit up our entire community with pride. And it's almost impossible to sum up how much Tony Gwen meant to our city. His accomplishments expand far beyond his many achievements on the field. Tony Gwen was a first ballot Hall of Famer off the field. Over the past 10 days, we've heard countless stories of Tony's kindness and his warmth. And I think that's because Tony was more than a baseball player. He was a San Diego icon. He showed the entire nation what San Diego is all about. Optimism, teamwork, excellence. And he did it all with a zest for life that couldn't be matched. Everyone, we've talked a lot about it this week, everyone felt like they knew Tony Gwynn, even if they never met him in person. He was as quick with a smile as he was with a bat. And his laugh traveled farther than any home run. You know, and it's been said that Tony Gwynn could have left San Diego for more money, but it was never about that. Instead, of course, Tony chose to stay here for his entire career. He made not only San Diego his home, but he invested himself in our future. He and Alicia created the Tony and Alicia Gwynn Foundation that is helping local youth become healthy, educated, and productive citizens of our great city. And of course, Tony also gave back by returning to San Diego State as head coach after he left professional baseball. He never forgot his roots. He remained a proud Aztec alum who mentored and inspired a new generation of athletes. Everything that Tony Gwynn did throughout his life became better, became so much better because of his 
association with it. Alicia, on behalf of a grateful city, I want to personally thank you and your family for everything that you have done for San Diego. On and off the field, Tony Gwynn brought us to new heights. On and off the field, Tony Gwynn made us proud. On and off the field, Tony Gwynn was more than Mr. Padre. Tony Gwynn was, without a doubt, Mr. San Diego. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. From one Aztec to another. Hope this is more uplifting than depressing, but it's on my phone now. Radio station sent it to me, and it'll always be on my phone. Because there was no laugh like that. There was no twang in that voice. Always told him, I said, you sound like you're from Alabama. You're from Long Beach, for heaven's sakes. He was doing a radio commercial at a radio station. <laughs> so if I rattle through this, we can get The greatest laugh of all time. And you know, you know, you know the hardest I ever saw him laugh that actually took the better part of an hour. We had a game in St. Louis, we're flying back, we have to refuel in Phoenix, we land in Phoenix, we refuel, and we're taking off, and we go, and they're serving hamburgers. Now, Tony's Tony, so he's laughing, and he's looking around, he got all surrounded by all these players, and while he's looking around, talking, Mark Davis, closer, Cy Young Award winner, reaches in and takes the meat out of his bun, out of the burger. Takes the hamburger patty out of there and puts the bun on top of the bun. And Tony doesn't know. He keeps talking and he keeps laughing. And I'm watching him and I'm watching him. And the players are watching him and watching him. And he keeps eating and he keeps eating. And he finally realizes, what the? Hey! And then he realized what they had done to him. And he started to laugh and laugh and laugh. And he would stop for five minutes on the flight to San Diego from Phoenix. And then he would think about what they did again. And he'd start up again. Oh, it was the best. It was the best. To be in Qualcomm in the clubhouse and watch him next to Ricky Henderson, nobody made him laugh like Ricky. Nobody. It was better than the game. I could have broadcast that instead of the game. Well, Ricky told him one time about this game where they played in the fog and the rain, and Ricky was out there all by himself in left field. He said, T, T, I was out there in left field. I felt like the lost Mohican. And Tony said, you mean the last Mohican? And they start to laugh and laugh and laugh. I know you will. You'll always remember that laugh. You'll always remember that man. To speak of him also, who knew him a long, long time. Not just holding political office, but a long time Padre fan and a long time Tony Gwynn fan. Welcome, San Diego County Supervisor Ron Roberts. Thank you, Ted, and good evening. What a wonderful turnout here tonight. When I was leaving last Saturday night's baseball game against the Dodgers, was walking back out to my car, I heard a voice calling me, Ron, Ron. I couldn't tell where it was coming from. It was a cab that was pulled over to the curb. And from inside the cab, I heard this voice coming out. And the driver was leaning over the passenger seat in the window. The passenger window was down. And he said, Ron, I need to talk to you. Well, I was sure he wanted to talk about the new regulations for cabs or some of the controversies that we're having in the taxi industry. I was surprised when he said, Ron, I want to talk to you about Tony. 
I really miss him. I feel terrible, Ron, and I needed to talk to someone. So we talked. Tonight, we're here because just like that taxi driver, we still need to talk. I've been a baseball fan all my life. I played the sport, but not very well. And I've attended many games at every conceivable level. In fact, as a youngster, I was at Lane Field when the Padres won their only Pacific Coast League championship. It was a victory over the Hollywood stars. Nobody would even remember they were a team. But we sure celebrated. And in a pure stroke, a coincidence, my first season, when I was able to afford a season ticket for the Padres, was the same year that Tony Gwynn joined the Major League Club. And was that lucky for me? Over time, I got a chance to know Tony and Alicia and their family. I got to listen to him talk baseball, and I got to call him a friend. We all know of Tony's exploits on the field. He was the greatest San Diego baseball player. And in sports, there are a number of good players. And that's why when we're young, we have a lot of sports heroes. When we get older, cynicism creeps in, and sometimes it makes us question their accomplishments. But we never question Tony Gwynn's accomplishments. <laughs> Tony worked hard, and he never cheated. Tony was a hero to us when we were younger, and he remained a hero to us as we aged. Lately, I've thought a lot about Tony and why he related so well to the common fan, the average man and woman out there. Was it his easy smile? Was it in his infectious laugh? Perhaps a little. But mostly, I think it was because we knew he worked very hard to achieve his Hall of Fame credentials. Like many others, success did not come easy for Tony Gwynn. Let me share what a Houston Astros 1981 scouting report said about Tony, he doesn't throw well. He labors to run and wobble sometime. He has slight timing hitch that causes him to inside out a lot of pitches. We saw him inside out a lot of hits too. He has some problems adjusting to off-speed and breaking pitches. I'm not making this up. And he was, he's extremely average at the plate. They should have said extremely high average at the plate. Now, in fairness to the Astros, the scout covered himself with a concluding statement. And he said, he could be a good hitter someday. <laughs> he got it right in the final line. Well, indeed, he was certainly that. And he certainly was much more. Since Tony's passing, I've been rereading some sections of George Will's great book, Men at Work. Tony's approach to his job as a professional baseball player 
is just as inspiring today as when the book was published in 1991. Thank you, Tony. You showed us that hard work pays off. You enriched our lives and you made us better people. I want to thank you for allowing me to be here tonight to talk to you once more about Tony Gwynn. Like my cab driver friend, we too need to talk to someone about our friend and our hero, Tony Gwynn. I would once again like to turn your attention, join us at the video screen as many people in and out of baseball, of all walks of life, talked about T during the time he played, after the time he played. He was an amazing craftsman to his art. His work ethic is second to none. He always had the most joy for the game. He always had the most childlike approach uh, once the game started. And uh, that, that, that's a lesson that we all need to remember. The youth of San Diego, I think what they respected most about Tony is not just the player, but the type of guy that he was. There's been a love affair with Tony Gwynn, even from his college days, because of the way uh, he treats people and, and the way he performed out there on the field. And there it is. He said he was going to do it, and he done it. I always remember Tony's chuckle. <laughs> I always remember that laugh where he wasn't in the mix. He was just enjoying it. And, and that's the way he liked it. <laughs> He's a genuine guy with so much class and so much excellence in what he did well. And uh, how lucky we are to have been able to rub shoulders with his greatness. Good luck, Tony! Quite honestly, I wanted to be more like Tony Gwynn than you could imagine. It was far reaching from when I started out in the major leagues to where I ended up was to be a complete hitter like Tony Gwynn. Just trying to emulate everything he did, trying to hit, shoot the 5.5 hole, and you know, whenever I got hits like that, I would be like, oh, that was like Tony Gwynn. So it was really exciting to, to be able to watch him and try to do things that he did. Line drive, center field, there it is, number 3,000 for Tony Gwynn. He was a guy that didn't really hit for power, but he just hit. He had such a passion for hitting. Um, it wasn't, uh, I think he enjoyed practice and uh, working at it, trying to get better as much as he did the actual hits in the game. I remember him after a game leaving the ballpark and going to a batting cage somewhere with his batting gloves. He was just so diligent in his work on trying to get it right. He was a perfectionist. Anybody that can do that for 19 straight seasons, I mean, that's a great ball play. A line drive in the left, Martin will die, take out of practice. Well, he was the best hitter that I ever faced, no question about it. And not only because he was a master at understanding his own abilities in the batter's box, but also he understood what the pitcher was trying to do. The best way to pitch Tony Gwynn was with nobody on. He really made you bear down on the guy before him and the guy after him because he was that good. There, there was really no game plan against him other than uh, if you can make him hit it to left field, that's kind of a success. Yes, sir. Base hit, Tony Gwynn. He drove me crazy, that's for sure because he'd hit a ball just to the left of the shortstop. So the next time up, I'd move the shortstop over and then he'd hit a ball right to the right of the shortstop. I said, doesn't this guy ever hit into a double play? He, he ran quickly, he could get the balls in the gap, wasn't afraid of the wall, and took pride in his defense. Defensively, you know, it was a little bit different. It didn't come as natural to him, you know. He, he worked from day one, he got the opportunity to, to play, he worked on his defense, you know. Five gold gloves kind of speak for itself. He's Mr. Padre, and uh, you know, he's the player that everybody attached themselves to, and we had some long, uh, lean years there, and, and everybody just loved him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He loved them, and they knew it. He himself available to the fans. He would talk baseball with anybody and uh, they, they uh, realized uh, what a talent he was but also what a great guy and a humble guy he was. My dad being one of the greatest hitters, you know, 
great defensive player, just a well-respected guy around the league and off the field, you know, I'm real proud of that, but obviously I'm most proud of that that's my father. Colleagues, Hall of Famers, teammates, a couple of brothers I like who are here, what I consider a baseball royalty if they would just take a quick bow because they've come a long way to honor Tony Gwynn, one who is going to the Hall of Fame as a manager and one that will be soon. Tony La Russa and Joe Torre, would you gentlemen please stand up? Thank you for being here. He learned how to play, and he learned that wasn't good enough. He had to pass it on to others. And somebody else, I'll take a bow here, because Tony told me this was the guy that taught him how to be a professional, how to give to the media, give of his time, give to the fans, sign those autographs. And that is Steve Garvey. Take a bow, Garve, right there. You bet. told me that's, that's where he learned watching that guy go about his business and then he turned it around and gave to other guys like our next speaker who loved him as we love him and boy Tony loved him. Welcome back DJ Damian Jackson. Thank you for having me, allowing me to be here. First of all, I would like to express my deepest condolences to Alicia, Anisha, uh, Tony Jr., and the whole family. God, were we blessed to have a Tony Gwynn in our lives. When I first met Tony Gwynn, it was on the back end of his career. And the only reason why I mention that is because he had accomplished so many things, uh, accolades and awards. And me being the baseball fan that I was, I was extremely aware of his presence. He was a baseball giant to me. One quick baseball story because who he was what, as a man so overshadows what he was as a baseball player, and that's amazing to me. But Tony Gwynn put the barrel on the ball so well. He had his own hit and run sign. And I had the pleasure of leading off for the Padres, and Tony hit second. And when I got on, he would give me the hit and run sign. You laugh, but it's amazing to me. But what Tony had the amazing ability to do was look at who's covering second while he's trying to recognize the pitch. So if the shortstop were to cover the steal or the base runner running, he would hit at the shortstop no matter where it was. And if they switched the coverage and the second baseman, covered, he would hook it and hit it to second base. Every time he put it on, it was first and third with no outs for the San Diego Padres. I've learned to pay attention with my eyes a lot. Um, and the one thing that you didn't have a hard time doing was 
paying attention to Tony, this baseball giant, as he not only showed us how to play the game the right way, but he also showed us how to be the right person and be a great, respected man in the community. But more importantly, family is something that stands out the most to me. That's something that I gravitate more towards. And boy, did he love his family. He talked about them daily. When he talked about his children, he just lit up like the sun. And it was something that I envied, partly because I never had a dad, and he would have been a great dad to have. So Tony taught and inspired us on a daily basis. Me being this young guy coming in here, gosh, I was so blessed um, to not only witness a Hall of Fame ball player, but he was a Hall of Fame man in my eyes. So I am so thankful today to be able to say thank you to Tony because you inspire me to be a better father. You inspire me to be a better man. And your legacy lives on in this city and in my heart. And thank you, Tony. May you rest in peace. Thank you, DJ. Share this quick letter with you that just, I never heard it put quite this way from a Dodger fan in Rancho Cucamonga to the sports editor of the Los Angeles Times, who wrote, Tony's passing will not only hurt the entire baseball world, but will be devastating to all of humanity as well. As a Dodger fan, I hated him. As a baseball player and humanitarian, I loved him. While working hard, he was always smiling, always laughing, and being jolly. He was Santa Claus in a baseball uniform. You can't write that. You can't make that up. That's what T meant to everyone here and so many millions more around this country. This gentleman has come to honor Tony because baseball has lost one of its favorite sons. He's come all the way from New York City to do so. Would you welcome, please, the chief executive officer of Major League Baseball, Mr. Rob Manfred. Good evening. On behalf of Commissioner Seelig and all of us at Major League Baseball, I'd like to thank the Padres organization and Ron Fowler in particular for giving us the opportunity to participate in a tribute to one of the greatest players of our time. It's It's an honor for me to be here to offer a few words about a player who gave so much to our great game. In my 25 years in the game, I've known scores of players. Even among this elite group, Tony Gwynn was special. He was special because of his Hall of Fame talent his devotion to the game, and the values he came to represent. 
when you're around the game, you hear people talk about the baseball family. Tony Gwynn may have been the perfect member of the baseball family. I would not presume to tell the fans of San Diego how great Tony was on the field. You had him all 20 years. But it was more than his talent on the field that made Tony great and a great member of our family. While he was playing, baseball could always count on Tony to do the right thing. He'd engage with the fans, he'd promote the game, he was a great role model to young players. In 1999, baseball honored Tony with his highest award for sportsmanship and community service, the Roberto Clemente Award. When Tony's playing days were done, you all know he continued to give back to his community. He taught young players how to be great players and how to live their lives. And right to the end, Tony remained a devoted member of the baseball family. One of his last projects was to make a public service announcement that will be used to educate Major League players and young players across America. Last week, we lost a great member of the baseball family. We should all strive to honor his memory by continuing his good works. Thank you very much. In my case, having been here as long as I've been here, I mean, there's people in this community that, that have grown up watching me play baseball. And now they have families of their own and they're bringing their own kids out to watch me play baseball. And when you think about that, it's, it's you know, it's a big responsibility. And all you can do is try to do the right thing. That's basically what I've tried to do. I just try to do the right thing. So he retired, and we thought for sure, and we kept asking him, okay, what are you going to do? Be a manager? Be a general manager? Make a lot of money? Hey, I'm coaching the Kansas, I'm coaching the San Diego State. <laughs> Theodore, that's all he called me, never called me anything else. Theodore, I'm coaching San Diego State. I've told you that's what we're doing. That was 2002, and that's where he was all through that time. He had no intention of ever leaving San Diego State. Just like when he wouldn't leave you and play for more money elsewhere in Major League Baseball, he would not leave the Aztecs for another job and more money elsewhere. <laughs> Rob mentioned those awards, including the Branch Rickey Award. Like Branch Rickey said, it's not the honor that you take with you, it's the legacy that you leave behind. And that's what T has done. Once an Aztec, always an Aztec. And he believed that. So welcome our next speaker, the man who took over when Tony had more treatments and was too ill to continue on and took Tony's boys on to the Mountain West Championship and the NCAA Regional and the College World Series in Louisiana, the executive head coach, Mark Martinez.
Good evening. Um, we got uh, some guys here to help me here at the end. This is current Arizona Diamondback and former Aztec Addison Reed. I'm going to do this one the opposite. This is former Aztec and future Florida Marlin Brad Hanel. It's an honor and a privilege to work with and be a part of Tony Gwynn's life the past nine years. And I hope I can give you a snapshot of what it was like on the Mesa at San Diego State the last nine years I worked with him and, and all of the 12 years he was there. He was my colleague, my mentor, but more importantly, my friend, my family. He was part of the Aztec family. And I can tell you, everybody on the Mesa doesn't refer to Tony as Tony. We refer, we refer to him as Coach Gwynn. Coach Gwynn's a teacher. And he was best at teaching all kinds of things, obviously baseball, but teaching life lessons. And he understood that baseball and being a student athlete was very complicated. Every single day you're met with a lot of challenges. And the bottom line, he just said it. All of his teachings was centered around his core value. Do things right. Right, guys? Do it right. And he just said that. And I can tell you, all our guys understand what he meant by that. Do it right in the classroom. Do it right on the baseball field. Respect people. Respect the game and do it with class. That's what he was about. Yeah, give it up. And by doing it right, Coach Gwynn, again, understood how complicated baseball was. So he tried to simplify the game. And again, baseball is hard. It's hard to hit a baseball. Not for Coach Gwynn, but most of us. And so on the Mesa, you know, simplifying the game for him, he, he would have sayings that he had all the time. And, and just to give you the snapshot, we would hear sayings like, Again, this is going to be the G-rated version. I hope you understand that, so I'm not going to do the, the PG-13, okay? He'd say, back it up. He would say, back that blank up. Hit it the other way. Simplify it. See it deep. He would say, hey, you can't play with a tight booty, man. <laughs> Loosen up your booty. Play with a little confidence, a little swag. Uh, again, G-rated. If you swing it doo-doo, you're going to get doo-doo. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Pitchers, very simple. Strike one. He knew how important it was to get ahead and account. He knew how difficult it was for our guys to hit 0-1. Now, it wasn't difficult for Coach Gwynn, but he knew our guys had a hard time hitting 0-1. Anytime he got done with these lessons, he would always say, any questions? There were never questions. He'd say, there never are. And then he would say, let's go to work. Let's go to work. Does that not embody what he was about for 20 years in the big leagues and 12 years on the Mesa? <laughs> Finally, Coach Gwynn is a gift. He's a gift to all of us. His laugh, his mentorship, the way he made you feel important even if he just met you for the first time. He gave these gifts every single day. And I can tell you that, Ted, you just mentioned Santa Claus. 
Our players know what I'm talking about here. Our players had two holidays every single, every single winter. Had the gift-giving holiday in December, and come January, Coach Gwynn showered them with gifts, right? They got more gear. Coach Gwynn loved gear. Damien, right? More gear than you can, I'm telling you, five players of cleats, five hats, stuff we never used. But it was his way of saying, you know what, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for giving that hard effort. The last gift he gave us, all of us on the Mesa, is he, he made sure that everybody that, that came through those doors at Tony Gwynn Stadium learned a fight song. And we sung that fight song after every victory in front of our home dugout at home. And when we got on the bus, even if it was in, in the mountains of Colorado Springs, we would sing that fight song as loud and proud as we could do it. And so what we would like to do here is hopefully, if, if you don't know the words, we all want to stand up. If you do know the words, we're going to sing along together. And for Coach Gwynn, it's going to be our gift to you tonight to sing the fight song one last time. Fight song for Coach Gwynn. what it is. Oh yeah, we're mourning, but we're celebrating an amazing, amazing life of an amazing, amazing man, our dear friend Tony Gwynn. I have always thought that the foundation, the cornerstones of this franchise had always been and will always be Randy Jones, who began it and put this franchise on the map in the 70s. Tony, of course. Gerald Francis Coleman, Jr. Gerald Francis Coleman, my broadcast partner, always, always. And the final cornerstone of this franchise will be our final speaker. And I'm proud to introduce him, as I've done on other occasions, proud to call him friend and another incredibly beloved padre. Would you welcome, please, number 51, the great Trevor Hoffman. Let me just recognize all the speakers that we've heard tonight and last Saturday and let you know that I, am, I marvel at the words that have come out of each and every one of your mouths because it's, it's been amazing, the, the picture that we've all been able to paint of one great man, Tony Gwynn. I said this on Saturday, it was about 21 years do ago to the date that I went from Florida to San Diego and became a Padre. <clears throat> it was the next day that I had an opportunity to look across the room at Jack Murphy Stadium and meet Mr. Padre, Tony Gwynn. He was back there in the corner by the video room, 
working on his craft. Got his bats, his gloves, his cleats, all in order, taking care of business. You know, Teddy talked about this podium right here, and it was one of the many gifts that I watched Tony over the years have, and that was whenever he got behind this and he had an opportunity to speak to you, the fans, it felt like he was talking to us one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, we got to see some, some video clips earlier, and it, every time I hear him, I feel like he's just looking at me, talking away, and there just happens to be 40,000 other people watching. Whether it was at Cooperstown, talking away just like he's talking to you every day. What a gift he gave us all. That joy that everybody's talked about and his smile and his laugh will be etched in our memories forever. Another great gift. Whether it was in that locker room talking with Tony Patriga the other day and talking about, you know, T always said, you give a little bit, you get a lot. How appropriate that was about T. Gwynn. Well, he gave a lot and still got a lot. What a great man, T. Gwynn. I stand up here with some jerseys and it's about his teams. Team Gwen, I see first. And Alicia, behind every great man and in front of is a great woman. <clears throat> and I thank you for your little brother's rendition and talking about how you guys met and the stories of you and T and the example you gave Tracy and I in representing your family on road trips and taking care of your children and giving us that gift, the tea in the clubhouse, and his joy in each every day coming to the ballpark. Thank you. That joy extended to his, his daughter, Anisha, whenever she would sing. And I love that picture of your daddy looking at you before you went down that aisle, because that was such his look. I had a hard time getting through it last Saturday talking about Anthony. That little boy. <clears throat> in that locker that I got a chance to see grow up and to be a fine young man and representing the Gwynn family oh so well today in Philadelphia. <clears throat> it was in one of those videos that we heard Tony say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Always being humble, always thanking us. Well, it's us that needs to be saying thank you to T. Gwynn. Thank you for your Hall of Fame career over 20 years sharing it with us. Thank you for representing San Diego with such class. And thank you for letting us all in your house tonight. Amen. Trevor Hoffman. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of the boys. I'll miss some. Just my eyesight is not what it used to be. Tyson Ross, Andrew Kashner is here. Ian Kennedy's here. Chase Headley, Yonder Alonso. Thank you for being here, boys. It means a lot to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One final, final guest. And if you saw that video of the event after the 3,000th hit in Montreal, and she was sitting on his lap, and he was just beaming, and he told me before that, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous, because his little girl was going to sing the national anthem. And she did like a Gwyn. She practiced, and she practiced, and she's a professional anyway, so she knocked it out of the park, as you would expect a Gwyn to do. Would you welcome, please, Tony's beloved daughter, Anisha Gwynn Jones?
Thank you. On behalf of all of the Gwynn family, I would just like to take the time to thank each and every one of you for all of the support and all of the love. Thank you. You guys are why my dad loves San Diego so much. So thank you, good night, God bless, and be safe. Thank you, Anisha. Coming toward the end of this program, celebrating the amazing life, this incandescent life of that smile, that laugh, that man, that work ethic, that personality, that character, that integrity. There are no words for this grief. I understand that. But I still thank you so much, you and the Padre family, for joining us here. And I'd like to impose, if I may, one more time the chant that we would hear, and I would be so lucky to say on the air, line drive to left field, two RBI double for Anthony Keith Gwynn. Can I get that chant that you always did in Jack Murphy and Qualcomm of Tony, Tony, Tony? Yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah. He was and will always be a shining light on this baseball team and this community. And we close tonight, and it seems poetic justice, that we return the favor and shine that light on number 19, Tony Gwynn.
me 